What's going on, everyone? Welcome to Essential Scares. I am your host, Corbin. With me today is Grant. Hello. Alan. Good evening. And of course, Bobby. Hey, yo, you already know what it is. We have quite the show ahead of us today. We're going to be talking about The Exorcist 3 Legion, and then we're going to do a quick discussion about the director's cut of the movie. And also, Alan's going to share some thoughts about The Exorcist 1, because it was his first time watching it, preparing for this movie. But before we get into all of that, Bobby has a spoiler warning for us. Bobby, bring us in. Of course. This will serve as your first one and only spoiler warning for The Exorcist 3 Legion. If you do not want this movie spoiled for you, please go to the time code below to find the spoiler-free essential discussion. <clears throat> The Exorcist 3 holds the distinct pleasure of not one, but two serial killers thinking it's their favorite movie. Corbin. <laughs> you know, I saw Please. that when I was looking up trivia for this movie, and I was like, hm, that totally makes, totally makes sense, and I don't know how I feel about it. Which two? Which two? Yeah. Danny Rowling and Jeffrey Dahmer. Oh, nice. Danny Rowling actually, like, in his confessions tried to snipe the whole Gemini killer idea. How yeah. dare he? Uh, honestly, yeah. the whole the whole concept of serial killers loving this movie is an extra layer of funny because this movie is heavily based on like the Zodiac killings, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's, it's just... almost as if it's almost as if Brad Dorif is the fucking best and does a serial oh. killer like Mwah. dude, yeah. he he did so good. Mwah. The Fred monologue Dorf. of him in the Dorf. prison cell with Kinderman, I was just like, bro, this guy is bumping this movie up points solely based on his own acting. Oh, yeah. I mean, the acting, oh, I, I think, so I think the acting overall in this movie is like shockingly good. Um, yeah. every, people are just acting their hearts out in this George movie. George Scott being yeah. just fucking, oh. What's this Herschel from The Walking Dead whose name escaped me? Oh, being the neurotic professor. Just so... Mm. God damn it, I don't know the names. I don't know the names. I'm sorry, the name sorry. guy. You are the name <laughs> not, guy, Grant. What are you doing? Uh, not this shit. week, I guess. Father Dyer and, and Kinderman's mm -hmm. relationship. Yeah. This movie is just a delight when it comes to acting. I also... So, like... Something that I really loved... Sorry, Grant. Uh, no, I, it's I fine. Just, I love that even though all those roles were all recast, right? Kinderman, Dyer, um, yeah. in a lot of ways, Father Karras. We'll get into that, I guess, probably. Um, they don't feel like different characters. Like, they absolutely feel yeah. like the 15 years later continuation of those characters. And I appreciate that because I think a lot of times in sequels, when you recast, you lose an element of the original. Um, and as much as I, you know, you always kind of want to see those actors come back, um, it, there was no loss of continuity for me. And I, I really think, I really attribute that a lot to the strength of the acting in this one. Oh, for sure, and I think, like, I mean, this was news to me, honestly, because, like you said, it just looked like the people were older. I didn't know the time span between these two movies. I didn't know that it was, like, recast everything. I was like, oh, they're just older now. Okay, that's cool. I'm into that. The only one that really stuck out was, like, when Patient X was supposed to be Karis. I'm like, that's not him. Yeah, it is. It, it, it is in the, in the theatrical cut. It oh. goes... Uh, yeah, so a quick background. Uh, there are two cuts of this movie, the theatrical cut and the director's cut. As of 2016, there's a proper director's cut that Scream Factory put out. Um, it's based more on the novel, the original version, before like studio interference came in and, and made uh, William Peter Blatty change a couple of things. Uh, we watched both versions between all of us. Bobby and myself watched both cuts. Alan watched the theatrical cut and Grant watched the director's cut. So we will uh, discuss that and then also try to be mindful of some of those uh, distinctions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I, for, so, I, forgot, I forgot that. that, that uh, that's a key difference. So Grant, yeah. actually, there's... Jason Miller is not Yeah, in, I mean, and that yeah, kind he's, of... Yeah, he is in, They're both in there. In the theatrical yeah. cut, they're both in there. So Jason Miller plays Father Karras, but then, like, when he's in the Gemini killer personality, it's Brad Dorf. So they go back oh. and forth. Yeah, Jason That's Miller really plays cool. the, Jason Miller plays the master as well as Father Karras. It's super fucking sick. 
Yeah. I was about to say, that was the one thing that, like, really upset me was, like, they made, you know, the big reveal, and uh, he was just like, oh, my God, it's Father Karras. And I was just like, no, he doesn't even look like him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, I guess, I guess you haven't seen him in a while because you're right. old now. I guess that cell was a little dark, but... Uh, but yeah, it would have been a lot more impactful if, if I was just like, wait a second, and then that was revealed. Yeah, um, I think that, that I do think that that's something that's, that you lose with the director's That scene cut. is super impactful, right? That, yeah. that first oh, yeah. scene where, where, again, it's it's very... It's, it's Jason Miller playing the Gemini, like playing Brad Dorf the Gen Gemini, but it's his face, right? So he's talking about like how we killed the little girl with the pink dress and the ruffles, right? But it's it's all Jason Miller, and he's old Jason Miller, and Jason Miller had a lot of issues with alcoholism, so he's very like he's very haggard, and it really works. And then mm -hmm. the no, I am not. I breathe. I go on. That 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 moment is the first time you see Brad Dorf. Like he gets up and gets up in their face and he's like he's screaming it and he's crying and he's just like I am not dead I am alive ah! I and really it, need to watch the theatrical oh, cut so it good awesome. yeah I'll say if you Shoot. if you already liked the director's cut you will definitely like the I theatrical did. cut yeah. yeah I thought it was really cool I feel like it was like the perfect like because I mean we talked about it when we watched the original Exorcist the whole like transition right that the second movie wasn't really it didn't really matter you could go to the third and so it felt like a perfect kind of like aftermath movie if sure. you know what i mean where like it's called the exorcism three but at least in the director's cut there isn't an exorcism and it's just how the characters go on afterward and like i was actually really digging like the murder mystery kind of theme that it was bringing to the table yeah for sure they're kind of taking that element from the exorcist the first one and pushing that to the next level uh and mm -hmm. i think that a lot of that comes from you know the author right he wrote the the first two novels and the screenplays and even though this is the exorcist 3 the movie so far as the books go this is just the second one um and you know, he's not traditionally a horror author and i think that mm -hmm. that's why i think that's part of why the horror succeeds because he's writing a different kind of story and the horror mm -hmm. is kind of just like built into it rather than being the purpose of it okay yeah when i was watching through it the genre shift is maybe a bit strong to say but this movie was kind of very fluid with um the elements of it sure. when you're watching uh, gemini kind of speak it feels like i'm watching a shakespearean drama and this guy's going off on a soliloquy just explaining everything as to what's going on all these oh, that was so ridiculous good. thing it, it has like a, a shakespearean play feel to it between these two characters and then there's just straight up comedic moments uh when uh father father dyer right he he says Go in peace, child. May the Schwartz be with you. I genuinely laughed out loud <laughs> at that moment. <laughs> Wonderful line. I In my head, I like to think that's improvised because it has a feel of improvisation to it. But at the same time, I doubt that. Um, I think my favorite it, joke was right before that. Uh, not, not right before that, but before they go into the uh, movie theater. Uh, Kinderman shows up late to the theater. And uh -huh. Father Dyer is like... <laughs> I've been standing out here for centuries. Four new popes have been elected. <laughs> and can in response, that's a lot of smoke. Yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> uh, it's so good. Like, I mean, even, like, the joke before the Schwartz be with you, where, like, she's like, okay, I'm here to draw your blood. My blood already was drawn. Who, who poked this guy? Who poked this like, guy? Wonderful oh, yeah. place, isn't it? <laughs> yep. <laughs> Your, um, your brother died in Vietnam. <laughs> Maybe it was connected. Oh, yeah. I have a question. I have a question that I need to ask Such because a great relationship. At yeah. the end of yeah. it, it felt very, very like, oh my god, they got me. Was Nurse Allerton a red herring the entire time? Yes. Or was she part? She was. So yep. she had nothing to do with any of like the uh, murders or anything. No. Nope. She even kind of says Holy it like the last, the last crap. time you see her, uh, he. Kinderman makes a comment to her, and she's just like, 
I'm a bitch, and then like you don't see her again, and like yeah. that's they it. <laughs> got me so good. Like yeah. I sat there and like I felt like it was like you know the the curtain was pulled back, and we me as the audience knew that she was the bad guy, and I'm sitting there like, sure. come on, you know, like everything is pointing to her, and it's just not her. And I went, oh my god, the movie it it got me. I was <laughs> oh wow. I mean, they even play that up when. Uh, I guess P- Pazuzu is the demon, correct? Yes. It's on. Legion. Legion is the demon. Legion. In this it's one. possessing oh. um, that uh, woman who is in a catatonic state, and she's even in there, like, looking at his brain waves. Like, they they play that up as as long as they can. Mm-hmm. They they really kind of really in thinking, oh, they maybe are working together. She would have maybe been the one helping him. We come to find out that's not the case. Right. Uh, they, even, they go into in depth about mm-hmm. like how you yes. can leave, and it's like, oh, mm-hmm. somebody yes. has to be helping him. Of course, <sighs> yeah. He just never they, he just never leaves. Like that's the that's the trick. Uh, yeah. Oh, true. Yeah. And it was so uh, the only person who helps him is the do- is the doctor who gives him the side of co- gives the 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 catatonic patients the cytocholine to give to the other people. Mm-hmm. Yep. The one thing that did bother me about the director's cut was, like, it felt like the perfect Aftermath movie. There was really no, like, overt, like, possessions going on. And then all of a sudden, woman's climbing on the ceiling. And I went, what the hell? And that's yeah. the only time anything abnormal really happens. And I was just kind of like... Why? Why? Like, if you're gonna go for this route, why include that? Scene? Oh my God, they don't have that. Scene. Yes, no, I think I think that that's one of the best. They don't have that beforehand. I think that's one of the best shots. The one in the church. The one in the church. In the director's cut, don't they? They don't have the one with like. Do they? Maybe I'm. I, I'm. I'm. Grant is talking about this scene. There's a scene in the hospital. In the hospital. Where... I know, but, yeah, but there's yeah, a yeah. scene. But but I'm saying it, that's the only. But there's a scene before that. But they're talking about Father Morning. So that like it's a scene. Yeah, that's just not morning. that's not at that's, all. In you, you you don't talk about the one with like yep. where like the Pope's statue turns into like the, the like the evil clown statue. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's not. not I saw the evil clown. There is an evil clown. Okay, moment. so that is okay. Is it, so that's there. okay. Maybe I missed yeah, it. Yeah, because it, it was very quick. Because basically, I mean, it is like just the regular statue, and then there's like a quick little flash to it where it's different, and then it goes off elsewhere. Yeah, and I thought that was just like a really cool kind of thing to include. Yeah, um, I thought I, I that that kind of gave a supernatural. I I think really like pushed the supernatural element, bit, like, in in both instances, I suppose, because like, I think that was really supposed because you like you kind of were figuring it out, but I think that was supposed to really nail down the fact that like, she he is possessing those the semi catatonic people to mm-hmm. do their killing. Yes, killings, and so mm-hmm. that was another person who was possessed in that it moment. Was, it was, oh. it was, it was him watching Kinderman figure it out. It mm-hmm. was so good. It like I so can't good. even like stress that. So like good. I love the. the so it was, I, it was a murder mystery, right? And me, uh, like I said, me as the audience, I have the peek behind the veil, and I was confused on what was going on. Like <laughs> I was like, oh, it's Allerton all the way, right? He can't get out of his cell. How is he doing any of this? And then it's just like the final like conclusion where you kind of everything is revealed to you. And I was just like, oh, shit. And like it, it's kind of amplified by the fact that it doesn't have the exorcism theme, like scene that we were talking about, right? It was it's just like, it, oh, my I. I'm surprised because like I've disagreed with Bobby before. But this movie just it's good. It's I, so I good. feel like Grant so, went into this liking the movie, and as soon as he started talking about it, he's like, "Wow, okay, wait a minute." <laughs> I think I love this movie. <laughs> yeah, I uh, Alan, have to before. disagree with you, Grant. I think because I did watch the theatrical cut, and I really love the exorcism scene because it's in part it's the exorcist. So mm. the idea of the exorcist without an exorcism is 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 a little strange. Yeah. Uh, but it's also the scene itself is really really awesome it's yeah. really um, good and it's like gory in the right way in a weird in a yes, weird way it's, and it's like, i yeah. i got so jacked i we've talked about how i like body horror i like things that are gross i like you know really embracing an r rating and this is the kind of shit i want you know he's, he's he he gets thrown around the room grant and okay. at one point he gets stuck to the ceiling all right 
and he has he's trying to pull himself away from the ceiling and he has to rip his like half his skull off most of his back skin i don't it's, like that on exactly oh, it's, it's you really shouldn't good. like it yeah but it's so good yeah. and, and it i happens. think i think it hits because there's not a lot of gore there's no there's at no, all you, you just see, see some anything, blood you know? and then it's suddenly yeah gross and like, it, like, it's not just simple little ooh, this is gross no it's you want you see the skin come off of his face his ear is missing there's a hole it's yeah. it really goes in there it's awesome I, I don't think I would like that. I'll so, have to watch the scene. Yeah. yeah. So, so Grant, uh, so Grant, what it does do that 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 is, I think, one of the things that is lack that is missing in the in the director's cut. Which again, I like both. I I told Corbin. I, I like I, both. Yeah. Yeah. But I I think I think Cor- uh, Grant does a really good explanation of why the director's cut is good. That makes it different from the theatrical cut. That it is much more grounded. Mm-hmm. And it, um, the yeah. director's cut, the, the theatrical cut is a little bit more. Um, clean cut and clear. It's much I more think. overtly supernatural. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. The, yes. With would, the I director's would. cut, you can kind of make some arguments that like maybe there isn't something going on. Like, yeah. But with the theatrical cut, that is not an option. Right. But, <laughs> and, but the only but thing it, that breaks that is the walking on the ceiling, which yeah. I want to stress because it really did like kind of take me out of it. It was the only thing that I really could sit well, there and, and go, why? Mm. And the fact that that that. The woman speaks in Brad Dourif's voice before she and has supernatural strength, right? right. Like it kind of, it kind of really nails right. that down. But that at the out. end was just, it was cool to me, right? Yeah. Like no, no, you're yeah. sitting there and you're just like, okay, I don't know what's happening. And then at the end, it's all revealed to you. Like it's yeah. all thrown on you after so much omniscience, and you're just like, holy crap, what well, is going on? But get, but getting back to the uh, to the exorcism, yeah, the exorcism starts. Right, Father Morning, who is the character in the in the in the theatrical cut, comes in and starts the exorcism, which is why Kinder, which is why like the lady falls back, because the master okay. has to go and fight the exorcism. So like mm-hmm. it kind of it kind of like wraps it around, makes it has has gives it a little bit more sense to why he's like Whoa! and falls oh, back. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so it's it's real, and the exorcism, both parts of the exorcism is. They're ju- it's just they're just tasty, right? Both mm-hmm. the Kinderman half and the Father Morning half, right? Because he just goes, and uh, Jason Miller playing the master is like talking about like, do you feel my rosary beads? And like the room is covered in snakes and fire out of nowhere, and it's just like this really like these and like my my the sweat of my brow, the work of my father, and it's just like oh, well, and, and then he gets then... thrown up into the wall. And gets stuck there, and like, yeah. like, 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 it's, it's like, it's very quick. It, it, it's some of those quick shots, but it's very much like, it's like he's, he's gum that got stuck to the ceiling is slowly peeling off, and it's yeah. just his skin, right? And when you, when you see that happen to him, it also gives stakes to <laughs> his actual character. We know how dangerous this thing is. We know from the previous movie, from what we've right. even seen in this movie. Yeah. But to see a man have his face ripped off For sure. sets the level of 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 violence For that sure. we know will come to Kinderman when he, or at least is possible to happen to Kinderman when he eventually goes to take on this challenge yeah. as a not necessarily holy man. Yeah, I also I get. Go for it. Uh, I I also just I really appreciate how different it is from the exorcism in the first movie. Yeah. Uh, you know the exorcism in the first movie laid the groundwork for exorcisms in film forever, and I like that despite that, which was already you know a theme by then. You know, seventeen years later, uh, from the the first movie coming out to the second movie. Um, despite that, you know the sec this this exorcism is nothing like that one you know it's fast it's violent it's very very different feeling and i think that it brings a level of intensity that uh not that it wasn't there in the first one but it's just a a really different vibe i I appreciated that i even and i think it really works Mm -hmm. because because again the 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 demon whether it's pazuzu or legion or even just gemini has had what like 20 years 15 to really yeah. 15 20 years in the mortal plane to really figure it out yeah right mm-hmm. and then it all culminates with the with the challenge of faith that him and kinderman has and it's this really cool moment where like kinderman gets blown up against the wall in the same way 
and then in uh, in the in, 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 a, in, in a Christ-like pose, and then all of a sudden, right, uh, 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 Karis comes out much like uh, what was the the kid's name? Reagan who gets murdered. No, the kid who gets murdered in the beginning. Oh, Thomas. Oh, Thomas. Thomas. Yeah. They explain how he was he was he was uh, crucified on oars, right? Yep. And mm-hmm. Kinderman comes up crucified on oars. And it's just like it just like they, do you believe now, Kinderman? And yeah. Kinderman has one of my favorite things that I'm going to read the quote of, because Grant didn't get a chance to see it, and it's just so good. So it is. This I believe in. I believe in death. I believe in disease. I believe in injustice and inhumanity, torture, anger, and hate. I believe in murder. I believe in pain. I believe in cruelty and infidelity. I believe in slime and stink and every crawling putrid thing. Every possible ugliness and corruption. You son of a bitch. I believe in you. It is just so good. Like I said, Shakespearean oh, drama at times. Yeah. So, the, and, 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 and the best George way, C. Scott sure. just hitting it. I, I mean, I really I am even the director's cut. Like, I mean, it's not hit as hard as like that quote, right? That quote is kind of like the he believes now because there is that halfway conversation at the diner wherever they're at where Father Dyer's talking to him and he's talking about how he doesn't believe in like, you know, heaven and everything. Right. Yeah. Um, and the fact that at the end, even in the director's cut, you get it because like. It's kind of ripping oh, sure. the Band-Aid off when he's just like, Karis. But, like, in the same vein, you're sitting there like, Hold, like this dude made a 180, right? Because yeah. he did not believe. He was firm believer. Like, that doesn't happen. And then Karis saves him from having his, I mean, getting choked out. And then he's just like, well, I believe. And it even goes further yeah. to, like, drive that point in when he holds the gun up to um, Patient X and says, Karis, pray for me. Mm-hmm. And, pray you know, for me, Damien. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I oh, think yeah, it, right. it, 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 sends, it sends a different message, but I think it, but like very much the same one, mm-hmm. right? Where like you get this like this wide, like angry, defiant, I believe in evil, like I like versus Damien. I believe, I hope, I hope, I hope you go somewhere good, yeah. right? Like there's, there's almost a melancholy to the director's cut, and the the um, the 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 theatrical cut is much more grand in that. Yeah. And it's not. It, I don't think one's better or worse. Although I prefer one. Um, I prefer they're the just theatrical diff- cut. They're, they're different. Uh, but but um, I I do think that one of the things that, uh, to me at least, is better about the theatrical cut, the ending specifically. Yeah. Is that it wraps up Father Karras's, uh story much more yeah. neatly, right? You have his story from the first one is much one very much about self doubt and about his doubt in the faith, and the you know the sequel, you know his sequel, his final thing is basically, you know his belief has succeeded to a point so grand that he can fight off the exorcism yeah. from within for, for just long enough. Yeah, you know that what I mean? It's me. Do it, Bill. Do it now. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, as much as I liked the abrupt finality of the director's cut, I really liked that about the theatrical because you're, you're really wrapping up. Like it's, it feels like a better sequel in that way. So oh. you're getting his through line complete. Right. And I'm getting those moments where I'm just like, man, this theatrical cut sounds like really good. And I want to watch it. Yeah, and then like should. the, the body horror that I really don't enjoy in movies a lot, like, I was kind it's of... Brief. It's brief. It's, uh, it's, it's very it, quick. It's very it, quick. It is quick. Um, quick, but, but evocative. I mean, one of the other differences yeah. in the director's cut compared to the theatrical cut, because I was watching the theatrical cut, thought that we were meant to watch the director's cut, and so switched to it. So I got the different <laughs> opening of the director's cut, right? Where it's okay. the oh, black sure. and white scene, he's walking down the street, and Thomas is there, right? You kind of get to see him before his fate has befallen him. At least that's who I think it is. Um, Thomas, and yeah. Yeah. yeah, and like he gets the rose and then falls down the infamous flight of stairs. Yeah. And like my only comment to that opening scene, besides like this is a really cool monologue to begin this movie, is 
him falling down the stairs made me dizzy because like they <laughs> did it so well that it yeah. looked like you were legitimately falling down the stairs great and stunt work it, also i watched yeah. i watched it with uh jill my wife and after they showed that scene because they sh they still show him tumble down the stairs in both cuts uh she was like wow like that's just a great stunt <laughs> yeah, like, honestly, it is real. like yeah. yeah, it's like somebody had to do that, you know. I mean, it... <laughs> so I guess the one question I have though is like, there the Whoa. weird moment. This is oh, already sorry. your second question. It couldn't possibly well, be your one question. I guess it's another question that I have <laughs> that I marked down is that in the director's cut, at least, there's like several moments where like it's like the camera quality changes too. Yeah. Yes. So I, that yeah, that is because uh, the reason why there wasn't a director's cut decades ago, which there would have been is because the studio lost, threw away, destroyed, whatever, the negatives for the parts of the movie that aren't in the theatrical oh, cut. Okay. And so those there, aren't even the best take. Yeah, there That's were rumors right. that it was actually available somewhere, and we had looked and looked and looked, and then Scream Factory eventually did manage to find like a palette of VHS tapes that were just dailies from filming. And okay. they just restored what they could, spliced it in, and that's just the best version that we'll ever get. Uh, but like, if if we had had all of the original footage, it would be very different. Yeah. Even those was... shots that were included would be different because those probably weren't the takes that would have been chosen. Even that was the main, like, one of the big questions I had was like, was this a stylistic choice? Was this supposed to be nope. like some kind of different angle that maybe I wasn't getting, but I was sitting there like. Why? Just I was curious. <laughs> did they do this on purpose? Why do they do this? <laughs> no, right. and like I, I thought it could have been my. What's that about? I thought it could have been like my like greenhornism mm -hmm. of in no. horror. Like, was no. this done for a particular reason? Was it homage? Was yeah. what was it? That's but fair. I guess it was. Yeah, it was, yeah. It was just preservation. It was just that's mm -hmm. as good. That's as good as it could get. Yeah. I mean, the some other... of those scenes were really good too. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Other... Some, some of them give really cool context. Yeah, yeah. like I, I really like, but like it, they're not better, but they're worse for the. Thank you for sure. Time. Alan? The other technical side issue that is very prevalent, and I checked to make sure it wasn't on my end before I even wanted to go into this, audio, the audio mix in this movie is not great. Oh, that's... A lot of... You're talking, lot about, the, you're talking about the mom's bad lip singing? Singing. No, I'm talking throughout the movie. The audio just fluctuates so wildly. I didn't know All that. over the... Oh, I, I noticed it real quick. I think it, the... just go ahead sorry it just seems like you have it's fairly noticeable with the gemini killer when his voices switch frequently um it's just you'll have a characters talking back and forth and someone will talk at this volume and then someone will talk at this volume and then someone will talk at this volume and then someone will and it that yeah just it, it's one of those things where that i once I saw it once, I saw it the rest of the movie. And the first time I saw it was maybe 10, 20 minutes into the movie. Oh. Is it an hour, hour 45 ish, hour 40 runtime? So every time it came up after that, I was like, there it is again. I Did that exist again, in, the, the, uh, the, in the director's cut, or was that different? I'd never it, sensed that. It is there in the director's cut, but some of the scenes where that's prevalent aren't in the. They, you know, they're different versions. Okay. Uh, in the theatrical cut, and the director's cut. I think the scene where this is most easily noticeable is when Kinderman is in the church talking to that other priest about exorcism and about um, all everything that's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, that's before he goes to like investigate things and he gets jump scared by the, the chick that's bringing him, bringing the priest the, the, the speech. There's something I want to say there. So that, that scene, that conversation between the two of them, that's the most obvious one because Kinderman's volume... And the priest's volume are so different, um, but they're sitting like right next to each other. So, if you okay. want an example of of that, that is the scene I would shoot to. It's it's like is, an hour in. That is a big pet peeve of mine, which is surprising because like I grew up watching uh, spaghetti westerns with my dad, right? <laughs> but like when like the the words are coming out the mouth, but the mouth is saying something else. Like I tune in on that, and it annoys the hell out of me like i can't i just can't watch shows if that's like the way it is well, the only way dubbing, i though right you think you're talking about wait you're talking about but you watch different? you watch spaghetti westerns and you can't do it no I, right so like that's the only time that i really get it but like i mean it's kind of oh, okay. the same kind of thing of like you know when it's 
it's lag, delay, whatever you want to call it. When someone is talking and then the words come out a second later, so like their mouth isn't synced up with the words. I I have a movie can't recommendation for you. Deal with it. Oh, you should God. watch. Just watch Kung Pao. Just have a great time. What a great movie. And to the Phenomenal fifth grade, movie. Yeah. great flick. So off topic, but a great movie. I'm I sorry. I, I, Everybody I a, should watch. Because Grant would love it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Alan talked about like the desync with. The... No, I, I I get it. I I get yeah, that okay. issue. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. We, no, you um, weren't the one off topic. I was the one who was yeah. running oh, okay. out off the train. Uh, were... Alan, you you had you had a you yes. had a point you're going to so, make about the courier. Yeah. With that whole sequence where you have Kinderman kind of walking out, the lights are flickering, uh, and he gets jump scared by this this college girl who's just like, I just wanted to bring him his speech, and she does, and as she's oh. walking away, she goes, the lights are doing a weird thing. How do you and it. Way? I don't know. It, that's my sorority girl voice. I don't fucking know. All right. She was the secretary. Um, I, don't I don't understand. Oh, I thought I thought no, this was on was the Georgetown secretary. campus. Oh, I was straight up thinking it was on Georgetown's campus, and she was some sorority girl. My bad. <laughs> Alan's um, back in the first the first movie. Just, <laughs> yep. The priest um, is just like, bring me the sorority girl that has is, my it speech. It is Georgetown still. It is yep. still Georgetown, but that's just the secretary. But we're fine. he's just handing out his doesn't speech. matter. Hey, write this for me. Oh. Doesn't matter. Yeah. When that sequence occurred and she said the lights are just flickering i i had a revelation with this with this movie where I, and this could be me just reading in reading something in that maybe wasn't intended to be there but the idea of kind of making your own reality in a way or hmm. or forcing your perception uh -huh. of an event mm -hmm. to be completely different than what it actually is mm -hmm. and i there was another i like that no i i, I yeah I, I get there was that. another moment later in the film i'm gonna have to look at my notes when i'm not talking to find it because i know i wrote it down but right. there's another moment that stuck out that was kind of similar to this where what we see is and maybe not exactly what is really happening and yes. this could be more of kinderman kind of his pain in a way kind of he's mm -hmm. he's expressing yeah. because clearly him and him and uh father uh dire Dyer. Dyer, Dyer, sorry Dyer. were very close i mean you, yeah. we that's very <laughs> evident in their fucking there's a lot of fathers, dialogue okay. yeah there's there's father this that and the other but <laughs> they're very close so he was hurt immensely by yeah, his great friends. well mm -hmm. and, and another point right at the beginning of the movie they both think that they're there to see each other to cheer each other up which yeah. is just really wholesome really like in a that, way. Yeah. I love that little touch because they both, it's very intentional that they both say, I gotta go cheer up Father Dyer. Yeah. I gotta well, go cheer up Bob. It's, it's I love really that well because, done there. You know, that's a, that's a callback, right, to the first movie. Like how they, you know, their relationship started, you know, over that discussion of, of film yeah. uh, mm -hmm. right right after Damien uh, kills himself, right? Right yeah. after the possession. Um, yeah. And I... I love that callback that it's the anniversary of that event and they're they're kind of both seeing it for what they want it to be and avoiding like their own personal trauma, right? Like associating the other person as, as two of what needs two to happen. Of, two of yeah. Paris's best friends become best friends mourning the loss of their best in, friend. Right. In the director's cut, right, we don't really get that whole like exorcism scene. We don't really get any of the like the real supernatural mm -hmm. scenes. And I thought that like the scene where, like, I mean, the lights do flicker in the director's cut, and the secretary brings the speech, and that's, like, I it's a really good way of breaking the tension, because you're sitting here, you're like, okay, it's the Exorcism 3, like, there has to be some kind of supernatural thing happening here, right? And you get the lights flickering, and at this point, as the audience, you're just like, here it comes. Here's where it's going to happen. And then she comes in with a speech, gives it to him, dissipates all of the tension... And she's like, yeah, the lights are doing a weird thing, and walks away. <laughs> yeah. And you're just, like, sitting there with, like, basically hands empty, wanting the supernatural and not getting anything. Like, yeah. what's going I'm... on? <laughs> what is this? I found my other moment of yep. kind of bringing your reality. So, the whole thing with the Gemini killer. Because we know that that is actually, that's Father Karis. But then we see the Gemini killer. So the idea that it, that kind of plays well with the idea of him seeing that Gemini killer. Now, part of that is, I think, 
in a way for just audience ease of understanding as opposed to having one actor try to portray two very different people. A lot of it is behind the scenes turmoil because Jason Miller was not fit enough to act yeah. both parts. Jason Miller's alcoholism was really struggling there for a That's while. That's why he wasn't yeah, he... in the director's cut because he wasn't going to come back at all and he kind of That's barely really... came back to do the parts that he did. Like I said, I thought part of this, when I came up with that, I'm like, Alan, are you re- is that what's actually happening or are you seeing that and, and yeah. th- trying to like think too deep for the scene but i mean i think i think that there's there's an element of that with patient x regardless right because you have kinderman seeing one or two people depending on the cut both of which are dead right it doesn't it almost doesn't matter who he's seeing it's a dead person yeah and two people that died on the same night and kinderman knows it right and so like whether he's seeing them both back to back or whether he's only seeing father Karras, which is the director's cut he only sees damien um you know the, it's a walking corpse regardless and and the director's cut does actually fill in some of the like the backstory there about like how that's possible i think that yeah. that is something that's missing from the theatrical cut because you're one other left thing, wondering like how did this happen one other thing to add to that too is when he's yeah. having that weird like heaven dream sequence um, what a trippy so sequence him, him it's a great Ronder scene it's a great let's, scene let's, yeah it is, let's go into that but one of the oh, guys. Oh, Thomas, I miss you. I'm so sorry you're dead. So I miss. love how nonchalant that is. I'm so yeah, sorry I'm you were. Like, you know, I'm so that? sorry. I wonder murdered. if we're both dreaming. No, <laughs> I'm not dreaming. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's like perfect, like foreshadowing, right? Because you, we as like again the audience know that his his time has come, and you're like you're playing with it because I really liked Father Dyer's character, where mm-hmm. he's in there like maybe maybe he didn't get got, maybe it's just a, a ploy, right? And then it's not. Uh, yeah, the very next scene. <laughs> you sit there and be like, he's like, he's not yeah. dreaming. And like any doubt you had of like, oh, well, it's just like a little ploy. You're like, no. <laughs> yep. Because you don't want to see w- what happens to Kinderman when his buddy dies, right? Like mm-hmm. this is like his guy. Oh, oh yeah, it every, hurt. Every, every character in this movie is compelling. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Every single one. So um, go for it. Uh, well, I was going to ask another question. If you're going to stay on the same topic, please continue. I was going to. I know. I was going to shift topics. Oh, I have one good. thing to so, add from from the heaven sequence. Okay. Uh, one of the guys explicitly says, "People on Earth are blind," and I think mm-hmm. a, a, that just yeah. the this that kind of got that line mixed with all the things. I was kind of like, oh. well, there's also oh, the one thought, the one funny guy. Because he's actually blind. Exactly. <laughs> yes. That, Samuel Jackson cameo um there's also yeah it is uh, there's no also shit. one guy okay. who says um uh something like nobody on nobody on earth li- is listening or something like that right and they're yeah. like trying to talk Whoa. through the radio and then l- l- shortly after that you have the woman who's like my radio's broken i only hear dead people and i think that that is a throwback right to the heaven scene. i feel like that could even be like a conclusion of like the whole religious themes of this of the exorcism trilogy is just like people on earth are blind right and it's it's kind of like throwing it like you can't confirm what you can't see kind of theory right like the whole like god doesn't exist because there's no proof that he exists um and then like the the thing like uh you know people aren't hearing is the same kind of thing and i mean that's the only time that it really i guess delves heavy into it besides you know at least in the director's cut, when Karis comes out of nowhere, is like, do it! It's kind of, like, abrupt, but yeah. um, it kind of plays on the r- religious themes. And I was waiting for those, and they didn't really come up as much as in the original Exorcism. Like, there are fathers, you know, but, like, that's kind of the only time that it really happens when they intend for it to happen, right? I, I think that, like, religion is involved in this one, but, like personal faith is less of an overarching yeah. story like, I, so I, I, would, I think it's it's there but it's not the first one is very much about that and this one right isn't. Yeah. and i was gonna say that could just be because like the pov we're kind of looking through in the original one is father Karis, right exactly he is a holy man and then i think three is more through the p i mean obviously it's through the pov of kinderman where he's denying like religion right yeah for most of the movie and that's really cool that like you can give the pov without being physically like first person with that person right <laughs> oh yeah yeah i don't know that's just that's awesome to third me that you person can... limited 
Yeah. Right. And um, I, that's just cool. I like that a lot. No, I, I I agree with you. I think I and I think I think this movie does a really good job of doing it in that way. Um, like you said, there's this very like you are very much behind Kinderman almost the entirety of the movie, but you're never feeling like you are Kinderman. He's a, he's mm-hmm. a very he like this movie is very good at like creating characters, right? Like. Like the opposite of that is like a Harry Potter film where Harry Potter is very clearly the stand in for you, yes. the, the person, right? Kinderman never felt like me uh, in any way, shape, or form where Harry Potter is half a, half a human being, half you, whoever you need him to be for that given moment. Kinderman is very clearly Kinderman. So you're almost stuck kind of on his shoulder you're not he's not always even making the decisions you'd make but you're like i guess i'm here for this i think right. I, I agree with you and, yeah, for and the that, that makes it so much more human right because like like you said harry potter is the clear protagonist if we're going to use that analogy right <laughs> any choice that a protagonist a would make he would make but yeah. like kinderman there are points where you're sitting there like i mean that's not the route I would take, but hey, power right. to you, which separates you, right? It yeah. makes you think, okay, Kinderman is a character, but you are, it's, you are looking through his point of view. Speaking of point of views, I want to talk about, if we can, the most iconic scene from this movie. Yes. And I, was, is... I was going to jump to this after, when Alan was talking about the courier. The yeah, yeah, I was like, oh, jump scare to jump. Yeah, oh, okay. Wait, is that... Lead us in, lead us in. Yeah. Let's this is talk the about... scene, Grant. This, Let's this talk the about scene. the most effective jump scare in cinema history. Let's talk about the scissors scene. Yeah, the hallway, oh the hallway God. scene. I, I, I oh call it. Yeah. <laughs> my God. Like, so good, right? It was one so of the good, only right? jump scares that we have watched through the entirety of Essential Scares and me personally watching horror movies that I rewound it to, like, analyze what was going on, right? So you're, sitting there, you're like, okay, so this young nurse, right, whatever, whoever she is, she goes into the room, nothing yeah. happened, right? You see the blue light, and she closes the door. It looks like she locks the door, and you're like, okay, cool. And then the door immediately opens because you see the blue light, and then the figure comes across with the scissors. And, like, I rewound it multiple times, like... She locked the door. What is going on? How long do you guys think that scene was? Oh, the whole scene. It feels the long. The, How long from, do you think that scene was? What do you I mean th- when you say that? Do I think it's only like two minutes, right? Point? Like, like, like from the beginning of that scene with the cop the and her that, hanging out. Yeah, when you first, when you comes first comes see in. her, and How then you have you the first jump scare, is? and then two minutes, three and a half minutes, three and a half minutes. I would go. Mm, yeah, I would I would go three and a half. I think that's three a safe bet. It's a minute and a half long, yeah. which that's, like it drags its tension it, though in the best way. It, yeah, right, exactly. Like the tension is used so effectively there that you sit there like this is taking forever. What's going on? And the fact that we all are two minutes over the amount is just like what I the think. Hell? Uh, oh, I, go ahead, Corbin. I was going to say the fact like, that it of... starts out where he's like, the master's giving me something. <laughs> something random something yeah. my way and it jumps to that scene you're like oh no i don't think yep. it had that did it, did it do the same in the director's cut it did it did he does I he does say it. that yeah mm-hmm. he and mumbled then, off for a little bit longer you know okay. you, so you already know who that nurse is right she had mm-hmm. a scene earlier on she gives her you know and then her name that in the... that scene he gives she gives her nurse? name in that scene. It's the nurse that accidentally comes to Father Dyer's yeah, room. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you kind of like know her a little bit. She's quirky. You feel for her, and like, I think that 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 helps, right? And then during that scene, what part? My favorite part of it, besides the the fact that it manages over the course of that ninety seconds, right, to build tension and deliver two effective jump scares, uh, is that. It also sets up the murder perfectly, right? Where the cops are, you know, the cops are there. Not just not one, but two cops are right there, and they show them talking to her, talking to each other, leaving the room at exactly the right times, coming back to kind of like, oh, it's not going to happen, leaving again, and then it, like, the entire sequence is so perfectly framed and set up. It's just wonderful. The and, greatest jump scare in cinematic history. And the one thing that I want to make sure I drive home is the red herring factor of Nurse Allerton. Because at the end of that, <laughs> you see her walk 
from left to right, right, and behind the desk, and then she comes out of her room, fully decked out in white, which you know is what it looked like, and she's just like, hey, and she says whatever she says. And at that point, I'm saying, I'm like, come on, it's her. <laughs> Literally every scene, someone dies. She's in the area. And it's just the perfect red herring. Oh, my God. Like, you're sitting there like, it's her. It's her. It's like, And you're watching the movie. You know what's going on. You're like, okay, every time any murder happens, she's around. I'm like, so happy you guys like this when, movie. I just when I I, can't get over it. When I watch that scene, the first jump scare, so she opens the door because the ice is falling, and then we get a very traditional jump scare. The second scare is... I don't think is a traditional jump scare in a way. It when I saw that occur, I didn't like ah jump. I went oh no! Like it, <laughs> it was a very different kind of. It was an fear oh shit that yes, and, <laughs> but that's but tying that into a previous scare it so it sets you up and the tension's released and you're like ah, oh, finally we're good. Okay, she just has to open this door. Whatever. Oh no! Like it's yep. it yep. it it sets you up. It lets you get. It lets you become vulnerable, uh, and then capitalizes on it right and then. It and there releases. And gets it releases just enough of the tension to p- almost put you at ease, and then it hits you so hard that you just go fuck. Don't like you know like yep. you said like oh no, no shit dude. like. Like, uh, so just... many, so many horror movies use the tension to a point where, like, you know that at the end of the tension, either nothing's going to happen or a kill is going to occur. Correct? Like, you sit there and you're just like, okay, this is going to happen. But like, this specific scene, you sit there, tension building, 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 like Alan said, and then it's released, and you're just like, huh? And then as you're exhaling, it happens. You're just like. <laughs> there was no tension buildup afterwards, right? There was nothing. It was, okay, she's going to lock the door. She's going to go back to do what she's doing. And then the door opens, blue light. Everything happens. Really cool scene. And just, like, th- the fact that they broke the tension and still had a jump scare that was noteworthy is amazing. So so I think I think this is why this scene works. Corbin brought it, brought it up partly. But I think part of it is because I, you have to dissect this scene. You just mm-hmm, like for those mm-hmm. of us who are just listening to this podcast who don't mind spoilers, go watch this movie, get to this scene, watch this scene because this scene this scene is like it is it is literally a masterclass in how to do a how to do a jump scare, and so right this scene is really cool because there's no real like it it's kind of unfocused in the background, like in like that very back area where like the desk is and stuff, but like it doesn't always it does not. Uh, it does not so unfocused that you can't see what's happening back there, mm-hmm. right? And so it gets to a point when she first leaves that first room that you're not even paying when it goes back to that wide shot, right? With the hallway and the thing and, and, and the room behind it, right? And so you go out there and you're like, okay, and you see the cops leave. And you see everything and you're kind of not even focusing on Nurse Keating anymore, right? right? You're kind of almost like, okay, the cops are leaving. They're going to go get check something out or go get whatever and your your guard is completely dropped simultaneously by the fact that like the scary thing you think already happened and like she's just locking up and you're like why is this why are they still showing this scene i wonder what that oh god you know what yeah. i mean like like, so, or you can even <sighs> yeah, figure like, out like, oh, what oh, you're the, experiencing. Oh, the, it oh, oh, the police officer left. Like, you're not even worried. You're like, oh, the police officer. Left. Why are they still showing shit? Like, it's just like I. So that I have to say, I don't agree with. I think that my guard was up. Right when the police officer left. Right, I sat like this was a convenient moment for something to happen. Right, and the the part that I think makes the scene masterful is the fact that you have your guard is up and you're just like, oh shit, something's going to happen. She goes into the room because she hears a sound. You're just like, oh shit, oh shit. Like the entire time it's building, it's building, it's building. The cop leaving is building it even more and then nothing happens. And so at that point, that's when you let your guard down. Your guard was up and then it goes down and then all of a sudden left to right. And you're just like, oh no, like... 
the reason I called it an oh shit scene is because I literally, when I watched it alone in my house, there was no reason for me to vocalize my thoughts, went, oh shit. And then I rewound it and watched it probably four or five more times just to, like, <laughs> analyze what was happening. It's just that good of a scene. Oh. And this movie is full of those. That's, like, like, and some of them are just, like, really good, like, really emotive acting that really works. But this is a scene that requires very little acting for it to be this good. And let's just, just while we're on the topic of, of scenes like this. What a fucking killer weapon, like, kill weapon, too. Yeah. What a, like, giant scissors. It's like the clock, it's like clock tower on the NES or Super <laughs> NES, right? Like, just like, my God. So, I guess, I mean, the, I, I don't, I don't know if I want to bring this up, but I'll bring it up anyways, right? The bring fact of, like, when what? they're, <laughs> at least in the director's cut, I don't know the theatrical cut, but in the director's cut, they're talking about, like, the how hard it is to open the scissors hmm? and you yeah, sit there and you and like um kinderman do, like tries to do it he's like this is this is really hard to open up like how and it's kind of like the I, I, this is why where the point of like i don't know if i want to bring this up is like the the not sexism but like you know like the how would a girl open this up kind of thing they explain it they do right. explain it. Yeah, they yeah, explain they, it they, in two different they, ways, actually. Yeah. Yeah. They say, they they say it, needs to, it, it needs to be calibrated. Anybody yeah. He's, he's, he's like, ah, oh, it's a little stiff. Yeah. yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah, so, but like, yeah, so you can see. The... Well, my my thing is, you can see Kerrigan's kind of like thought. Pre- at least in my opinion, like I was thinking that Kerrigan was thinking. Kinderman. That. Kinderman. Sorry. Ker- Kerrigan. <laughs> Who the hell is Kerrigan? From Star Trek. Uh, yeah. <laughs> True. Uh, Kinderman was thinking that Allerton, Nurse Allerton, was the killer, just like I was, right? We were both in the same boat in that regard, me and uh, Kinderman. And he was just like, how would how would someone open this up? And then he's like, oh, it needs calibration. And then he also, I think he said something along the lines of, like, getting it opened up is actually the harder part. Having it close is very easy. Well, it closes itself, so yeah. yeah. Right, it closes itself. So like you sit there and you're just like oh shit, but I mean that that was just like a besides the point kind of thing where like yeah, that's I mean, where my I, mind was. I, I don't see, I don't see that one. I, I'm gonna Not, I guess I'm gonna disagree. I don't think that. That's... I get it. I a hundred percent. I think it's a a take that is out there, but I mean that was where I think Kinderman's mind was at, and that's why he kind of brought it up. It's, like, I, it's even harder. I for also me to do it. what I'll say I, is that I don't think that. I don't. I didn't really feel like the nurse was ever part of it. Really? Yeah. Maybe it's because, like, as I've seen it before, but definitely, like, this, I, when I was watching it, I, I was never like, ah. turn. So even oh. but, so, like, I definitely didn't think like, oh, Kinderman was thinking, oh, there's no way she could do this. Like that. That so, thought did not enter my mind at all. So, so uh, let me put, let me put it this way. I think that she is very clearly a red herring. And yes. I think for the director's cut especially, if you've only watched that version, it's your first time you don't know anything about it, I can very clearly see why that is. Because she is, they show her, she's she's the nurse that's bringing the, the woman who kills the first priest to the yes. to the church. Mm-hmm. She's there the entire movie. She is plausible, she's plausibly at every single scene. Where I don't agree with you is with the, anything with that scene to make it have anything to do with her. I think that's. I think that scene is meant to show, and maybe it is to add her to the list of suspects to show that anybody can do it because these things are so easy to to use. Right? Mm-hmm. You just you you open it up and it can it can get decapitate a head very easily. Because and you mean the that's... scene where she's where where Kinderman is like examining? Yeah, where he's the... like, where's the okay. other one? Right? Where where, okay. very, where where they make it very clear that this is the mm-hmm. murder weapon, right? Okay. Or not? Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, 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 I'm gonna take the I'm gonna take the radical centrist route here and say both of you are right and both of you are wrong, and only Thanks, my opinion is the right opinion as always. <laughs> Let's go. Well, oh, like God. I mean, even just like the whole like that scene happens and then she comes out of the room like I said, decked in all white, and you sit there like, and at that point you're almost a hundred percent sure because she's been in every scene, uh-huh. like at least like the the pre scene to what happened right you know with the church she's there before the scene happens where the priest gets inevitably murdered right the nurse she's there after the nurse is murdered in the direction that the person went and you're sitting there and you're just like dude 
she's right there. And, like, she even, I feel like the actor even gives off, like, that, like, nonchalant personality of, like, yeah, whatever, like, this is just another day in the chop. That makes you even doubt her a little more, where you're just like, okay, come on. Like, yeah, that's the, that, I think that's the importance of the, the scene where she's, like, where after she, like, uh, where, like, Kinderman is basically, like, I think you might be it. And she's just like, I'm a bitch. And even that scene where, like, she's just pissed off that Kinderman busts in on her and the kid, and she's, like, trying to feed the kid something or, like, give the kid a she present. She toys. It's toys. Yeah, she had, she had toys. And, like, so, it's so, like, she's just being a good nurse at that yeah. moment. And, like, would you treat your own family like this? Just leave. Will you please leave is, like, meant to really send home that, like, no, nah, she's just a nurse trying to do her job. Like, I, because I think, I think, I think you're right, Grant. I, I do think a big part of this is very much meant to be, like, it could be her. It, she it, she could she could be the accomplice. She's the one who takes care of them, right? Like maybe she right. got stuck, suckered and, in by I this mean, shit. To, like and even, the doc and we know we know the doctor that she works with is is got suckered in by it because he just killed himself. Doctor Temple, that's yeah. his name. I remembered yeah. it. Um, but I mean, like, he got threatened with what? What was the quote? Something like violence you could never understand, or pain you could it, something very evocative. He got threatened, by, evocative. The centerbites, baby. He got threatened yeah. by the centerbites, Dude, baby. Guys, the reason that I'm seeing even like the nurse uh, being the one, right, is even like when they're talking about like the blood was drawn from Father Dyer, right? Yeah. Every oh, separate way, they're just, about they're that, just like, the yeah, Sorry. all of his blood was emptied and it's just like neat and organized there was not a single droplet of blood you're sitting there and besides the writing behind his uh bed you're just sitting there like she has to like the per whoever the killer is has to be at least medically trained somewhat to be able to drain him of all his blood without a single droplet spilling i'll right? be honest i didn't think that at all really? i no i when you're speaking to an artist when I saw that scene, so initially when I saw his entire body was drained of blood, and then they wrote, it's a wonderful life on the wall, uh, I didn't at all think this person had to have medical training that killed him. I just thought, we're dealing with a demon of some kind, we already kind of know that given it's the exorcist, so anything's on the table in terms of how this would occur, um, I, I didn't think at all that there was okay. any sort of medical involvement there. I didn't so, make that connection personally. I mean, the, so this actually leads me to a question that I did want to ask of like- Another question? I know, I have a lot of questions. This is but question that's four or five. I, I, know, I know, I know. Out of, so out of one. I'm so, <laughs> <laughs> I'm so interested about this movie because I want to dissect it to its fullest extent. Is, at least with the director's cut, if sure. you cut out the scene of kinderman saying damien out of nowhere and the catatonic patient walking along the ceiling this is a murder mystery this isn't a horror movie mm -hmm. right am i wrong to assume that that would be the genre that you would put it in if those two scenes were excluded and the name was not given to you right and you were just watching a movie you would sit there and it would be a murder mystery because there's really no supernatural be thing going on. It can, it it's can, still both, I think. Yeah. yeah, I think that there are plenty of thrillers or murder mysteries that are definitely are like horror, horror adjacent. I think this would remain. Would you say? Is. Would you say that like Criminal Minds for a show is a murder mystery horror show? Yeah. Like it's true. I, I get. I get. I get what you're saying. Does there. true crime fall within the realm of horror? I, I get I get what you're saying, yeah. but like I mean, it's just I don't like, think that it, it needs to be supernatural to be a horror movie. I think that even removing okay. those two elements, I think it would remain because most of the horror, most of the scares are not related to that, and so like it would retain the mood, yeah. it would retain the horror style uh, else elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So I think yes, okay. I think yes. I I hear what you're saying, but I think that I think that it's scary enough it's creepy enough it's scary it, definitely and, and and it's and it's 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 thought provoking about the horrors of anything like, like i think i think the thought the thought that you get when you watch this movie is the questions that are asked 
produce terror in human beings, which I think is what horror, elevated horror, which I think this movie ultimately is an elevated horror movie. It adds you to would, that you too. would you would say that. I would absolutely <laughs> say that like, like a thousand times out of a thousand. This I don't is know. not popcorn horror, baby. It's, Even though it's it's enjoyable. It's the director's cut that really gets me over anything, because like what I'm what I'm well, seeing. Well, that's because that's what like, you watched, my guy. Right. I know, I know, but what I'm saying is, is like, besides those two scenes, it's really just you wondering what really is going on. Okay, here. but but you still even said this movie is scary, right? Did you just said that? Yeah. Is it only scary because the one woman walked on the ceiling, or is the movie scary? I think. I think that the movie is scary. <laughs> yes, I under I, I I know what you're saying. But no, like, no, I mean, no, not not even no. Grant. I just want to live in the world where the guy's like, I wasn't scared, but then the spooky woman walked on the ceiling. <laughs> I'm not saying it's you, Grant, but be like, I was just, I was fine. I thought this was, I was a hilarious fine. romp. Yeah. I no. thought it was, I, I thought it was a really funny romp, but then the spooky old lady walked on the ceiling. Yeah, no, and I, I think got that... the heebie-jeebies. Right. The, a lot of the horror comes from like the unknown, right? And I think that's where a lot of horror like really comes from. And you're yeah. sitting there like, what is going on here? Because like, yeah, for I, sure. I mean, no, I, I, I've, no, I agree. I've beaten a dead horse with I, this where I say yep. like, even people think, behind the veil don't know what's going on. I think that you see a lot of you see a lot of horror movies that are police procedurals in disguise. This is like its own yeah. subgenre, and I think that this movie would fall into that spoiler so alert me... a lot of the letter hellraiser movies are that okay. and they're not good so, saw, saw I mean, is a franchise yeah. that's like built on that basically yeah. like i think that might be it becomes like, that yeah as i yeah, said something the, that has even the first with, one has elements of it uh the me yes. being a kind of newbie in the horror right where like i don't really i haven't had such a plethora I, of content i don't, I don't to... think so I, I i wouldn't i wouldn't put yourself down like that i think you still rec you still recognized that it was scary <laughs> Right, yeah. and I think that, uh, you know, defining horror is something that everybody kind of does in their own way, and sure. I have always had a very wide uh, definition of the genre, and I think that even if this movie was, you take out the supernatural elements, even if this movie was uh, the Gemini killer passing notes through the hallway and just convincing people to ki to kill for him even if you'd removed every single element of the the unknown this movie remains a horror movie that would be my okay. psycho is a horror movie this is a horror movie even without the supernatural right. yeah i agree okay wait I, real quick real quick real quick oh, okay i think you <laughs> I, I want i want to i want to touch on i want to touch on the score again I love that. I I also wanted that was my last note, so I'm glad that we're talking okay. about that. Last, all right. <laughs> last so, bit I want. So the score the score before the score. Score yes. before when do we I, when do you want me to talk about Exorcist? Do you want me to just bring that up when I score this one? That's like its own like like little mini bit. So. Okay. Yeah, While you yeah. talk about the score, I'll be right back. Okay. All right. Oh. <laughs> this is the this is the this is the first piss of uh, of Alan's podcast career as a host. True. He has the bladder um, of second actually boy. Yeah. In, in in but but let's talk about the score. Let's yes. talk about the score. Um I think that I one of the coolest things that happened in this movie happens right in the very beginning. Because it starts out very much with the original exorcist theme. The Which theme I love. Theme, and then, and then, and then it immediately fades into the groaning and grumbling yep. of, of of what this movie is, and it it sets a completely separate tone uh, for what this movie is and should be. And that 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 little groaning and grumbling is just it's so subtle, but it is. I think one of the most fundamentally terrifying pieces of soundtrack in horror mm -hmm. because it's, it's not beating you over the head, but it's sinister. Like it's something that you could like, there are people who are like on Halloween night, they play soundtracks. Yep. Mm -hmm. If you play that, I wouldn't go to your house if I was a kid. <laughs> guilty. You know what I mean? Guilty. Guilty. Like, like, but like, but like, I would go to the houses where they would do like, like they would like 
like do like the murder sounds like this is the murder house and i'd be like oh this uh, on whatever this is fa-. you know what i mean like yeah and but like that i would have never gone to that house and they utilize that m- more than a few times like yeah. during during the movie i think always at the opportune moment always any at the time, opportune any, moment. any time that there is a supernatural happening they use it and that's only when they use it yeah so like there's almost like Which this is, just it's great because they're never they're never trying to trick you. Like it, yeah. it's it's always legit. It's always it yeah. really is. Yeah. Just, there it is. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, what the jump scare also had like a really good little like note that it went into. <laughs> the, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And to a movie that really had no jump scares, for that to come out of nowhere, and it's like near the end of the movie, for that to just kind of creep out of the woodwork, you're kind of like, oh okay like that was one of the things that made me go oh shit was not just what was happening on screen but the fact that the music yeah like the score was able to match what was happening it's kind of like it's so minimalist but every time it needs to be something it is yeah i mean even when like the original score is happening you're sitting there and you're going like what's going on in the background like you're trying to like analyze what's going on to see okay supernatural stuff's coming what's going on what's going on here it's just it's interesting. And Everything I, I really works for the whole score. product, and the score is just another piece of like, like it wor- like it it stands out on its own. I think, and yes. Anchor, but I, want, I want to give you a, ch- a chance to talk about it, but like it stands out on its own, where like you notice it, but you don't ever notice it in like a way where it's like it's bad. It's just like you notice it as a cue to look for something else, or you notice it because it adds to the jump. You know what I mean? Like you, yeah. it's a like I think. And I think that, like, it's really hard to be a soundtrack that you notice because it's adding to a movie in a way that, like, is, I don't know, that's, it's really hard to do that, especially with how little they give you with a soundtrack. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think that it's, it's, it's minimal, like you said. I mean, I think that the thing about this soundtrack is that this, the score, I should say, right, it's not a soundtrack, the score is that it's is not very present right and i yeah. think that that lends to the grounded feeling that most of the movie has um you get that with a lot of procedural type content right not a lot of music because it's like oh we're here we are we're just solving the case you know we don't need you know there's no music and i think that lends credibility to the realism and typically the scores is coming in even when it's not just the monster sounds you know the score is coming in when supernatural things are were happening or when something more significant is happening. So, like, mm-hmm. in the theatrical cut, um, there's, like, there are a couple of swells, uh, like, when Father Morning comes in, like, at the end, you know, and it's like, yeah. okay, you don't hear... That music isn't happening throughout the rest of the music, you're not, or through the rest of the movie. You're not f- getting that feeling. And so it's elevating his character, who you honestly barely know... Yeah. Um, in a way that allows him to do take his part Feel in important. the film exactly. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, so the music is sort of speaking is speaking for you, um, and I think it does a really good job with that. I yeah, I, I have a kind of negative thing not on the score but on sound effects. So oftentimes no, there's these dem- like demonic sounds. Uh oh that <laughs> Bobby was just talking about this. <laughs> I don't know that they hit for me all the time. You're an oh. idiot. I'm sorry, Alan. You're oh, an idiot. I just they You're they you're stupid. So I'm so mad at you. So, it's not I want, random, but just It's no, they're perfect. Uh, I want to say happen every time perfectly. <laughs> yeah. You fucking so, moron. I'm going to fight you in real that, life. I just don't find them. It, it it felt very cheesy. Like you know when what? I you know when what? they would occur. You know what? You got you got a month. Okay, we're building pures in old school yeah. RuneScape. Maybe in the wildy. So <laughs> I think I think the whole thing behind it is that, like as Corbin said, it was very so minimal, bad. but it's very impactful. Like when you hear these things kind of breaching through the background of what you're watching, you understand that what's happening on the screen is very important and the like the sound uh, the score is amplifying that right and i mean it's just like it's the whole like it's not there but when it's there it's important and you should watch it and so like even the whole what you're saying ellen of the groaning and stuff 
you may not enjoy it, but you know that when that groaning is happening, there's something happening on screen that maybe I... you should be paying attention to. <laughs> See, I didn't that didn't necessarily play for me. When when that because I feel like there was a lot of false instances of that where there's just this random demonic groaning that seemingly comes out of nowhere. Nah. And doesn't really do much. Now, when we're dealing with with uh, uh Gemini Killer and he just roars randomly i'm into that because there's context behind the reason we're hearing demon sounds but when you're just with a general catatonic patient and you hear out of yeah. nowhere so, it just so but it, it's because it didn't it didn't hit for me it's where the master or the demon is lingering yeah no so that makes so just, much sense i, I, so didn't, mad have, that. I didn't I want that at all the idea of he's say, just around hanging out because you hear his gurgling like that didn't come through for me at all. i wanted to say that i am holding um, for, for for audio yeah. only listeners i'm holding my hands so I'll be so right now. I I want to point out the difference between maybe the <laughs> different like the key difference between the direction or the directors and a theatrical cut, right? Is that with Alan, like there is like this supernatural thing going on, but for the director's cut, there really isn't too much. And so that groaning and like the stuff that's kind of just there subtly kind of lets you know while watching the director's cut that there is a little something extra going on that maybe the scene is not alluding to maybe there's a difference there i mean that's the only reason i can think that like i'm sitting here like this stuff's really important and alan is like i don't give a shit it just didn't hit for me i, I oftentimes when that that groaning came around i was like this just right. seems like a, a a bad sound effect out of nowhere but there's even some groaning happening in the the introductory scene of the director's cut right Yes, and, uh, and, and oh. in the normal cut as well. Okay, so, like, you sit there and you're just like, okay, so, like, there is a presence here that is beyond the natural. And I guess that's what kind of keeps you along, especially in the director's cut, with the the fact that this is an exorcist movie, where besides the two scenes that really do allude to the fact that there is, like, supernatural going on, those groans kind of keep you in tune of, like, this is an exorcist movie, and there is something extra going on here. See, but I already knew there was something extra going on. There. Right, but that, like I said, difference between theatrical and directors. Yeah. Let's. I'm move sorry, on. Bobby. Sorry <laughs> to disappoint you. Uh, Alan, okay. why don't you disappoint Bobby further? <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna give your score first. Uh, for everybody that's listening, we rate our movies zero out of five with half points, so three point five, four, four point five, etc. Alan, bring it. Don't make me fly off the handle again, Alan, please. Well, we'll see. We'll see, Bobby. Making you fly off the handle is great for content. Um, True. So I I did enjoy this movie quite a bit. Um, I, I think it really did a great job in being a sequel to The Exorcist um, because clearly The Exorcist 2 doesn't exist, and I will not hear anything else about it. So that... I watched The Exorcist 1 the night before, and I watched The Exorcist today, uh, four hours ago or so, five hours ago, something like that. It was very fresh for me, having watched this. And I think that after watching it, it did have those technical audio issues that I mentioned. Those those gurgling sounds did just, I they didn't work for me. And the first tone was a little weird at points in this movie by that i mean the first half and the second half feel very different and that's not inherently a bad thing per se because as the movie ratchet up ratchets up and you have your rising action like that it's naturally going to maybe have a bit of a tone shift this is a horror movie that's kind of normal for those um but o overall i definitely liked it a lot uh i i I said that I think this is probably my personal favorite and potentially best sequel to a horror movie compared to others out there. Uh, I, I think it continues the story of our characters in a way that's interesting. Uh, the, we didn't necessarily touch on it, but the scene when uh, they're talking about Father uh, Father uh, or Damien is dying, Gemini Killer has died, and Legion just forces them into one body again is so just 
it's good stuff. Uh, it, the movie almost takes itself too seriously at times, in a way that that kind of came off. Some of the acting was, I wouldn't say overacted per se, but it was very emotional at times when I didn't necessarily expect it to be. And I didn't expect the acting to be nearly to the caliber that we got it. I was kind of expecting a pretty middle of the road experience because it's a horror sequel and that's pretty standard for horror sequels to just kind of... So what you're telling me is you weren't expecting it to be the elevated horror that it is. I definitely was not... Ex I was coming into this movie going, this is not going to be nearly as good as The Exorcist 1 and I was happily uh shown that no i think it was right on par with the exorcist i think it was right in line in which case i would give this movie a four out of five wow 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 so oh. that is well I, I we'll 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 get into it after our essentials discussion because i really want you to go <laughs> off a little bit about the exorcist because i know you have controversial ice, thoughts on that movie. Ice cold, like, controversial. bearing straight I, takes. I'm already chilly based off these takes. I, it's like I don't disagree with the score, but I'm having trouble coming to terms with the reason. <laughs> hey, 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 Corbin, speaking um, of scores, what's yours? So oh. I, I like this movie quite a bit, right? I think it's generally good. I think it's well shot. I think that William Peter Blatty does a decent job as the director. Uh, I think that the fact that this was his second movie and that he is clearly not a director shows. Um, I think that the movie is saved by the acting in a lot of ways. I think that if the actors were not as good as they were, this movie would be largely forgotten um in especially when we're talking about it the way that we are i think that even though i really enjoyed the long no uh, monologues and novelesque dialogue sometimes it's a little too much sometimes it goes a little too far for a movie um i liked it i'd recommend it i would give this a 3.5 it's not incredible i think I think I think it's a very smart movie, but it's not always a great movie. Bobby has been thoroughly surprised for the past two ratings, and I'm really into it. <laughs> oh boy! <laughs> Speaking of Bobby, oh oh, they got him last. <laughs> Let us know. What do you think, bud? This is this is probably one of. The f my favorite movies that I've watched in my adult life. Um, I fancy myself an actor. So part of why I like this movie is this movie is an actor's movie. It is a master class on acting through two really, really important and underappreciated actors. Uh, George C. Scott and um, Brad Dorif. Both really good actors. Everything that they're in, they give their all to. They never, they never half-ass it. From what I've seen of them, like, like I, Fred Dorif was in a, was a guest episode in the show Psych, and like gave a full-on, full-throated shot at it. So like, he's great. He, in Lord of the Rings. Everything he does, he tries. <laughs> like so, like it does. Like, I give him fucking credit no matter what. Um. This movie is, I, I think, I think you're right in a lot of ways carried by its acting. But I think that this movie is a hap, maybe it's a happy accident. Maybe it's the fact that like, uh, 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 Blatty had a a vision of what he wanted, and the studio execs understood what that vision should be when it comes to the theatrical cut, and like added just enough to make it work. Um, that kind of really brought it all together. This movie has flaws. I'm not, I'm aware of them, right? Sometimes the voice sync is not there. Um, I don't, and some of the minor characters are not great when it comes to, like, Kinderman's family. I don't know if the grandma's that good of an actress. I don't know if the wife's that good of an actress. The daughter's fine, but she's barely in the movie, so I've got not enough time to, like, say one way or the other. They're small things, but they're enough that I can't give it a five out of five, so it's a four and a half out of five for me. I love this movie to death. I want to make this clear. I would recommend this movie to 
anybody is just if 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 you've watched the spoiler cast enough to know that like we've all sung this movie's praises it's so good but it's a four and a half out of five grant grant yeah oh man okay so i was like half not halfway through the movie around halfway through the movie and i was sitting there like okay this is a three and a half like three out of five right around that amount right like i don't hate it i don't love it but then you have the brad dwarf monologue that like you sit there and as corbin said like the acting saves this movie at points and i think that like that entire monologue of him talking about how he did it what he did and all that you're sitting there like holy like i was getting i feel like this is maybe a little offshoot, but like Heath Leather, Heath Ledger's Joker from The Dark Knight, I feel like may have been based off of Brad Dwarf's uh, Patient X in this, right? Where he kind of has that like kind of like, oh, why did I do it? This is why I did it, right? At least that's what I was getting from it as someone who went back and watched it. Um, but just like a lot of the there's not even many issues with the movie. The issues I had with the director's cut specifically are like the lack of supernatural real things going on, but then you have the catatonic woman walking on the ceiling, right? That took me out of it. The, like, him just... Yeah, he hears Damien's voice out of nowhere, but I feel like now that we've talked about it, the exorcism, if that would have taken place, hearing Damien's voice near the end of that, or, like, even throughout, you'd sit there and go, like, okay, Damien is, like battling with this like he's trying to help kinderman um and i think that maybe my rating has been impacted by the fact i did watch the director's cut and not the theatrical cut but even the director's cut i have to give a four out of five wow uh i was borderline four and a half because like the two scenes that i have trouble with are very short and I really, really do enjoy the one use of a red herring to the effectiveness that this was used with um, the nurse. Grant, just watch the theatrical cut. That that point five's gonna come like, that, like right, that. exactly. As well as like, just the the aftermath feel of the movie. Like right. it has the title Exorcist Three, but in the director's cut, you don't feel like it's an exorcist movie. You think it's like the it, it it is like a true sequel right but like without the supernatural aspects you're sitting there like this is what they're doing after you know damien's death and after maybe a couple years of the relationship between father dyer and kinderman like flourishing and it was really cool to see after skipping exorcist 2 which i'm probably happy i skipped Oh yeah, seriously. Uh, anybody who's watched this and haven't watched this, you just don't, just, just don't. It's a, it's bad. It over-explains everything from the first movie. Everything that this movie doesn't do, it does. It's just like the fruition of the relationship between Kinderman and Dyer, from the end of the original Exorcist to the beginning of this movie, that. Again, as Corbin stated, the acting really lends itself to saving this movie of, like, just multiple times you're saying they're like, okay, even though there are different castings and all this, the movie feels like it's the same actors, which is impressive. So I have to give it a four. All right. What a set of scores, boys. What a set of scores. Um, I'll, you know what? I'm I'm gonna go ahead and say it, Corbin. You're yeah. wrong. Well, you always you always say that though. Um, that's true. Okay, no, that's so fair. I will. What I will say is that so I've seen this movie before, and Bobby's seen this movie before, several times in fact. Uh, and when we decided to watch this movie for the show, we did not expect. I definitely. I'm pretty sure Bobby did as well we did not expect this to go the way that it went (laughs) i I did not i'm I'm very happy that people loved this movie i did not expect scores like this what is going on um for audio listeners my camera just like completely dominated itself for no reason (laughs) that's really bright for for something yeah um 
but I'm happy. I'm happy that you guys liked it. You know, I mean, it's definitely yeah. the second best Exorcist movie. Uh, <laughs> I would agree. Or on the same level. I mean, you're yeah, wrong. I wouldn't <laughs> say that. Wouldn't say that. Listen, listen. I like this movie more. It's the second best Exorcist movie. <laughs> Moving on to, uh, in many ways, the core aspect of the review, right? Shit. Is it essential? I think that, uh, you know, you remember, right? Quality doesn't ha- necessarily determine essentiality. I think that that is a fact that goes both ways. Uh, there's plenty of bad movies that I would say are essential. This is a good movie. We've all just determined it. I had the lowest score, 3.5. Uh, if you skipped ahead to this, I, ha- I gave it a 3.5 out of 5. Alan gave it a 4. Grant gave it a 4. Bobby gave it 4.5. High scoring film. But is it essential? Oh, Grant? Man. Oh. Kick us off. Me? I told Oof. you I told you in the pre-show run that you, you were did. going first. You did, and I was hoping you changed your mind. You told us mind. before we I sang felt, Arms Wide. You told us before we even sang. I, yeah. I loved this movie. I thought it was really good. Mm-hmm. But I, I don't think it was essential to the horror genre as like a whole right i don't think it did anything that you sat there and gone oh my god this was so influential to everything past it right and just it's so tough because i really do like the movie this is the first movie that i can say i enjoyed but i don't know if i can mark it as an essential horror movie would i recommend this to people if you've seen the original exorcist yes but if you were looking to get into horror, I don't know if I would put this on the list of, like, this needs to be a movie you watch. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Corbin's camera dominated itself again, and so that's why I giggled. Yeah, what is going on? <laughs> um, but it hurts me. Bobby, I want to make sure, because you are the the highest rater of this movie, it hurts me to say it. But I don't think that this movie is essential and i think that's i think that's fair um as we go i didn't mention it of course we all know this is a spoiler free section so uh just be careful of that obviously yes. Gr- grant of course didn't say any spoilers but i tried you know after alan oh. last week you know oh yeah i just spoiled line. everything yeah. <laughs> um speaking of alan what do you what do you think about this movie i also is it essential no um i think this is probably going to be as as a podcast one of the movies that we score the highest and talk a lot of praise about but then ultimately say no it's not essential and the reason i think that is is in part the franchise it's within every person who exists knows the exorcists you need the exorcist. Every sorry. person who Every exists. Every person that exists. But you get my point. Like, it, yeah. I was being hyperbolic. But <laughs> it is so... The exorcist one is so iconic. It's so well-known. It's a beloved film. There are scenes, the power of Christ compels you. There are so many parts to the original exorcist that it, it is clearly a movie you should see if you want to experience a moment in horror and i think in part that stops the exorcist 3 from being essential Mm -hmm. because it it has the unfortunate uh distinction of being in the same franchise so when you have these two movies and if i had to say you have to pick one to watch i would tell you to watch the original exorcist before you'd watch this one not for context story really related reasons but because if if you're trying to watch a horror movie you should watch the first one that's you really should in my opinion okay i'm gonna go next because alan brought up a point that i think keys into my thought pretty squarely actually alan said that this movie couldn't be essential partially because it's not iconic 
And I remember I have the lowest rating on this, but I actually have to fight that a little bit. I think that as a one of the, you know, if getting into the the cast a little bit, Bobby and I are a little (laughs) more, I I I slammed my desk, I'm so full of energy. Uh, Channeling Kinderman while he's getting all (laughs) mad and stuff. I've been I've been a horror fan for as long as I've been alive, right? My family is a horror family. We've been into horror forever. And I think that this movie has a lot of things in it that are iconic in their own way. I think that Brad Dorif's turn as Patient X is integral to the, to the film and incredible. I think that the scene the uh jump scare is one of the most iconic jump scares in all of horror i think that even people who don't like this movie bring that scene up as a masterful sequence and i do think that its designation of being part of the exorcist family is actually part of why i would say what i'm saying because i think that this movie is an essential sequel to the exorcist I think that this movie does everything that a horror sequel needs to do. I think that it follows up The Exorcist pretty much as well as one could possibly hope for. I think that it's essential because it shows you what a good horror sequel should be while still remaining its own movie. This movie is essential. Hell yeah. (laughs) Bobby. I'm going to go ahead and admit I was waffling up yeah. until Alan's discussion on whether or not this movie is essential. And when Alan was describing that it can't be essential and all these reasons why I couldn't, it made me think. Up until I had watched this movie, I had never considered myself a horror fan. I liked horror movies. I watched a lot of horror movies. I probably was a horror movie fan before this movie. Just straight up. Um, this movie was suggested to me by a lot of horror icons, right? And when I started suggesting this movie to other people who I knew were horror fans, who knew horror more than me, and the fact that they didn't know this movie made me recognize that this movie was essential. Because this is the horror movie fan's horror movie. Whether it is Brad Dorif's wonderful acting, George C. Scott's wonderful acting, whether it is that scene, the jump scare scene, that is a famous scene. This movie, it was the movie that made me realize I was a horror. I was part of the horror movie community. Like, I was a part of that community. Because, like, it was just something that hit me, right? And I think, like, I think Corbin's point is really well said as well. That it, it, fe- it is essential because it is the essential sequel. It's a sequel that is greatly underappreciated. It's a hidden gem within but it's a hidden gem that is like i mean we have people of all different shape and size we have two veterans we have somebody grant who i would say is a journeyman and i mean that sincerely like you're not necessarily a newcomer we you've seen some of the ways here but you're not necessarily a veteran yet and we have a newcomer in alan everybody said this movie was great and nobody would have watched it if it wasn't for somebody else suggesting it it's an essential movie lost to time and that's why i have to give this movie its essentiality it's okay. just no 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 i i 100 <laughs> percent agree with you um i just i'm trying to think of like reasons why i may have been off the mark one you're not off the mark you you, right i I think that there are a lot of arguments to go both ways i mean i definitely i'll i'll say that the last time i watched this movie was years ago years ago you know Mm -hmm. 10 15 years you know it's been forever and my memories of this movie were definitely not essential i went into this movie thinking absolutely i'm gonna say it's not essential of course not it's the exorcist three like and i think that i was surprised a little bit by my 
by my viewing yeah. of it. Um, so, but I definitely think there's arguments either way. I don't think that you or Alan are wrong in saying that no, it's not essential. I no, think, but I, I, think I that's came totally into this fair. fully thinking I was going to give myself give it an unessential rating for what it's worth. I really uh, thought, but well, but it was just listening to all of it and like hearing myself and having these thoughts in my head that really brought me to like, yeah. this is just a movie that you show people and that's their entrance into the fandom. Right. So it's it's hitting me because I'm sitting here and thinking like, I mean, just because we're, I think for the first time, evenly split on essential and non-essential. I do have a tiebreaker. Um, and my, my thing that I have a question about is, could it be because Alan and I are newer that we haven't experienced enough sequels to realize that a lot of sequels aren't that great <laughs> and that this one actually <laughs> lives up to the name of its predecessor i think there's I a few go... I, I don't know if i would say that it it necessarily that it fully lives well, up to it doesn't I mean, need I think to be that... like it doesn't need to be right there with the other one right yeah. i mean like it can hold the <laughs> same title know. without bringing disgrace <laughs> right yeah do you know what i do you know what i mean yeah, i definitely don't like... think that this is a dis- i mean i definitely don't think it's a disgraceful sequel i think that there are a few i think that there's a few and i think that we'll, we'll get to them for sure mm-hmm. um uh, and I think that there are a few horror sequels that are even more iconic than their their first one. Mm-hmm. One in particular with Friday the 13th, I'll just say it. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, I don't, I, don't, I don't know that I would say it's because you've seen less sequels. I mean, okay. I, I think that... I think that your opinion is totally valid. I don't. I don't know that your opinion would change with time or with seeing a thousand more horror movies, you know? Maybe right. it will. Maybe we so, revisit this ten years from now, and and then you have a different opinion. You know who knows? But right. you were so pretty like, glowing already. So yeah. The, the the main thought besides that that I had is just like you guys had talked about the like exorcism uh, scene being very important, and it's like when you think of like when I thought back to the original Exorcist, like Father Marin has a heart attack in. I guess what they that's so, what they yeah. called it to I'll, me. And I feel like this I mean I don't know for sure because obviously I'm a journeyman but like the obviously. the physical the say. physical endurance that it takes for an exorcism I think you guys had alluded to being like first brought up here in this movie of like it's not just oh it's something behind the scenes like this dude literally had the the back end of his body torn to shreds which i never got to see um i'm curious if that may be i don't think it'll change your mind i really I, don't i yeah okay exactly. I, I, I was gonna like it i, was gonna I think you like it but I, I don't think it'll I, I don't think it'll change your mind i think i think i i i, I think especially yours fuck you will and fuck you fuck you fuck you buddy <laughs> uh uh reasoning is is sound i i think i and i i will fully admit that my essentiality comes from me feeling a particular way based off of how other people like it it, it, me hearing about this movie from like podcasts and like like names within the horror movie or like people who are like horror movie fans talking about this movie being great and then me watching it and then me extending it to a a very good friend of mine who is more into for horror movies than I am and is not Corbin um like and having him being like, I haven't heard of this, and then watching it and being like, that was really good, and then extending something to me and us like growing our portfolio even to within this past week, him suggesting something to me really made like this was just the first movie that made me feel a part of like a fandom. Um, it's mine's completely bi- my essentiality is completely biased. I I own that, but and like. And like it'll probably be the only movie that ever is that for me. But this movie is so tied to that for me that I can't. I was I almost untied myself from it. Then Alan made his review, and I can't. I can't help but retie myself to it. So I think you're right. I think Grant, you have, you have, a, you have a fully you're fully fair for this. But it yeah. then why does it hurt? <laughs> because, because you liked because the movie. You liked it. it. Like because this is it very very exactly. early on in Essential Scares for me to sit here and be like. I love this movie, but why don't I think it's essential? 
I think oh. that's, that's a core part of the discussion, though. I don't think that lo- liking oh, the movie man. has anything to do with it being essential, necessarily. But why does it hurt so much? Right! I mean... <sighs> uh, Alan has a point, and then I have the tiebreaker. Oh, boy. Uh, I think part of the reason that Grant and I... It's kind of a similar reason that Grant was saying why we don't necessarily see it as essential is I think we're at different levels in our experience with horror. And I... By that, I mean, I look at this as how would I recommend this to someone who is at my level with horror and my experience with horror. And that, in part, kind of brings in, is this a movie I would think I should tell someone to go and see? This this is like, you've got a top five, you got to get The Exorcist 3 in that top five, and your first five you're going to view. And that, to me, is not is i think where we're we're at i i i I think too how would i show what i want (laughs) to what i show talk to my mom and be like hey mom the exorcist 3 right up your alley that's you gotta see it it's a great horror movie probably not but that's what i mean i i am definitely still in the the novice category which is ironic given that i've known corbin and his family basically my entire life but as we've talked about I'm a little bitch baby when it came to <laughs> horror things. For the first 25 years of my life, probably, at least. So I'm still very much new to this. So I think that's kind of where our perspective comes from um, Yeah. at that level. So you'll notice we're split down the middle. If you're mm-hmm. watching this, oh, no. it's literally half and half of the screen. Obviously, we can't leave it on its high, right? That would be no. ridiculous. What do we tell people? It's kind of essential scares. Insanity. We have to have an answer. I watched this movie with my wife. Oh, uh, no. She is a burgeoning horror fan. Uh, I introduced her to the genre. Uh, we have kind of like brought her up into it. She's watched a lot of the same movies that I have over the last you know, seven or eight years. She said... Uh, she would give this a 3.5. She loved the discussions, the characters. She loved the way that it attacked, like, that it showed, you know, the the characters in their older age and the way that they uh, interacted with each other. Uh, she said that um, she was legitimately spooked and scared by the scene. She said it was a great movie. But that it was not essential. Fuck you, Bobby. Fuck you, Bobby. Fuck you, Bobby. A pox on the Corbin family. <laughs> Have you ever had a more bittersweet feeling? Me? I don't. I'm me. Fine with it. Well, uh, I'm you. sitting there like my opinion in terms of scoreboard. I is win. Correct, but at what cost? But in terms of <laughs> internal debate, is yet to be determined. <laughs> Fuck it. Grant's gonna go to sleep tonight. And just be speaking, like, why speaking didn't I of call dumb sleep? trek. What have you been up to, Corbin? Your <laughs> dumb, dumb wife. Wife is dumb. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm actually, I'm actually gonna pass it off. We're gonna start with Alan. Oh boy. Because I want Alan to briefly talk about The Exorcist, the first one. Yeah. Uh, so if there are, are there are eggs. there going are you are there gonna be spoilers, Alan? Uh, it's probably best to put a spoiler warning of some kind up, just to be safe. Okay. Quick spoiler warning. The Exorcist is the sequel, a prequel, to The Exorcist 3. I wish you would have said, what, what was the prequel called? Uh, the Exorcist, uh, um... Beginnings or some dumb yeah, shit? Yeah, you should have, I wish you had said the, the, <laughs> the sequel, sequel to The, to the Exorcist. Exorcist's beginning. <laughs> uh, um, uh, Alan? All right, yeah. Oh I'll, boy, I'll, Alan, I'll toss, you better be ready. I'll toss a timestamp in there for everybody that doesn't want to hear Exorcist One spoilers. Alan's going to talk about his experience with The Exorcist briefly, not a full review. We'll do an episode later, and then we'll wrap up. Alan, so I'm going to start with my rating and then go from there. So I would give The Exorcist a four out of five. Uh, when I was watching that movie, right. I felt the. <laughs> Pacing was not too great. Um, I uh, 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 just in general, it 
it dragged for me a lot in the middle yeah. portions of the movie. Yeah. I did enjoy once we got to the second half and things started to ramp up a bit. That that kind of brought me back into it. Uh, Almost I feel like that's the point. But it it dragged too much. I understand the idea of needing to set up what's going to happen, but when I'm sitting there just nodding off because I'm bored by what's occurring on the screen in front of me, that's a problem. Did you accidentally watch the theatrical cut? <laughs> no, he didn't, I promise. <laughs> Sorry, Bobby. Okay, Bobby so follow-up right question. Now. Did you accidentally watch The Exorcist 2? <laughs> no, I did not actually watch The Exorcist 2. I can promise you that. Um, um, dog, they show a whole ass spinal tap. Are you kidding me? Twice. Twice? I just. Yeah, twice. I didn't need to see it a second I, time. I just have a hard time believing that you watched the same movie that I watched. Because that was my first time <laughs> seeing The Exorcist 2. <laughs> Fucking good score! Jesus Christ! <laughs> I, I want to point out, recently I watched The Exorcist, the original movie, for the first time. And I thought it was amazing. Perfect, even. And so, yeah, perfect, uh, even. Beyond so reproach is what I said to Bobby in our DMs. When Alan just, was watching it, I was like, I what I said to Bobby, I'm gonna cry if Alan doesn't like it. This movie is beyond reproach. <laughs> I just... Four out of five. I enjoyed and liked the movie. I just can't... I, I, I can't... It's, res it's respectable. But it's tough. It's, it's tough to swallow. Is it? It's tough to swallow, that score. But it's... You can yeah! Swallow. Listen, it's listen. like the cherry-flavored cough syrup hard to swallow. Listen, in practice episodes for this show, we did The Exorcist with some guest hosts. And the guest host was my brother. And he gave the lowest score with a four and a half. And I was mad at him for that. You think I'm going to be less mad at Alan? No, I get it. I understand your fury. But that's just the thing for me. Pacing matters a lot. And when I'm when I'm bored in a movie, that like really just doesn't, that, that yanks me out of it in a very real way. And this um, wasn't in a marathon or... setting either, right? You didn't watch one and then three. No, I watched one last night and watched three that like, today about five hours ago i am so, i'm like just that. i'm just flabbergasted i i i don't know again i like grant's flabbergasted me and corbin are ready to disown you <laughs> i i just I, you know i i i official did official disclaimer alan's opinions are not essentially the essential opinions <laughs> oh of the God. essential scares <laughs> podcast yeah, yeah, yeah throw I, the text along the screen <laughs> i think the best thing that comes out of this and we have to remember is that Alan likes The Exorcist three just as much, and that's <laughs> that's you know some kudos to Exorcist three. That is, it really is. Yes. It's yeah. almost a shock that he didn't make that essential. I still, I would, it's not I would iconic. call The Exorcist essential. I would. The Exorcist is absolutely essential. Yeah, Spoilers that's for me. whenever we do that one. Yeah, that's, <laughs> Spoiler that's a, alert. Trying to not make, trying to make it a to no say I know you, the other, although it's pretty obvious. All of you looking for a horror podcast maybe haven't seen the yeah. critically acclaimed Exorcist, yeah. but we consider it essential. Is, is, uh, the, is, the, is the only horror, is the yeah. first horror movie to ever be nominated for Best Picture essential? Who knows? I mean, and I think one of the things about The Exorcist, just one, one. can I give one positive thing I really enjoyed about it? You can give God. as many as you want. The fact uh, that everything isn't positive is, is an <laughs> insult to this movie, you piece of shit, but go ahead. I think it's graphic use of language for the time is very well done. The idea of uh, uh, saying cunt just liberally in a movie from a child in 1973 sure is i mean you have to think through like the 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 uh what was it the uh, M mpd right or no mp who MPAA. writes mpa mpaa yeah you you have to imagine mpd sorry that's that's video games sorry um when you that's a mile, you miles imagine, per denominator i think <laughs> <laughs> when this movie MPD, across, that's video games <laughs> When this movie came to them, and they see the just obscene language said, it, I, that had to come up. Which makes me think, 
did they have to cut something? What's the what are some of the more original lines that could have came in the original cut of this movie? Stuff like that kind of just gets the gears turn in there when you see something given the time period it was released and made and what they actually were able to get away with and release sure. to well, a I mean, wide remember, audience. Remember is... that you didn't watch the version that came out in 1973. Oh. <laughs> you watched the director's cut which which came out like 20 years later okay so you can get away with a little little bit more in that one yeah the oh, word cunt like really puts the r in horror for alan <laughs> the hard or r horror for alan <laughs> um all right that's that's enough of that let's let's <laughs> that move really on good, that was really good <laughs> thank you good. thank you so grant uh tell us about all your star trekking adventures Oh yeah, dude. So Star Trek has been completely irrelevant to my adventures. Um, I've played a good amount of League. I've played a good amount of Smite. Actually, for the first time last night, I got a pentakill in Smite, and it was probably single-handedly the, the best what is fight. A pen- what does the pentakill mean? In so, uh, so mobas are five v five traditionally, and um, a pentakill is getting all five final hits on the enemies. But it, it, resulting in a pentakill. So basically, you get all five kills, right? Yes. Um, and that honestly was probably, in my opinion, the best fight that I've ever played of Smite. Where, like, I sat there and, like, I looked at it because I obviously recorded it because it's my first pentakill. I sat there and went, I think I did everything right that I possibly could have done through my, like, knowledge of League of Legends and how you're supposed to play certain characters. I can kind of. You can transfer that over to smite and kind of know what you're doing you 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 didn't lo- you didn't luck into it right exactly like it felt like i was doing what i should be doing um for the record st- moba stands for multiplayer online battle arena true i'm sorry it doesn't I... matter i'm just i'm just making it very <laughs> clear for anybody who has no idea what video games are um besides that i played nemesis a little bit of nemesis in dead by daylight the new killer um, he's really fun. I like the uh, like the zombie touch, like the AI, because it's the first time that Dead by Daylight really has done AI in their game. Um, other than that, I've, I've just been indulging in more and more music, trying to kind of diversify what I listen to. Um, Sleep Talk is my next big song that I've kind of thrown out in the Discord, which you should join, by the way. Um, we talk about basically anything you, if you listen to this podcast, would like to talk about. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's that it's basically uneventful. Besides work, I've been playing a little bit of games, listening to a little bit of music. That's about it. Nice. Very cool. Very Alan? Cool. Sleep Talk by the band Dayseeker. Yes. Hmm. So I haven't had a ton going on well, you um, watched the exorcist i mean yeah i watched the exorcist <laughs> and gave five. a very cold review um, on i rolled credits on returnal now rolling credits in a game like returnal means nothing uh because there's even more to do still um i've really enjoyed that that game plays with uh the madness of your character kind of experiencing over and over and over again the same core events in a way that you as the player also then experience by doing the same events. Oh, it's it's a really well done connection between you as the player and you as the character that is not often done by roguelike games or just games in general. Um so it's that's that's been the big one I've been playing. I also picked up uh, Borrowed Ratchet and Clank, I should say, from a buddy. Uh, it may be the single greatest looking video game I've ever played. It's a new one. Yes, it's stunning. Is it good? Uh, genuinely stunning. I, I mean, you, you boot it. You're just your jaws open from the moment you take control of Ratchet. It's it's just just gorgeous. Big fan um, of Ratchet and Clank. It's I I mean I wouldn't necessarily say go buy out go out and buy a PS5 to play this game. But by holiday season, when you've got like Horizon and then Ratchet, you can go back and play Returnal and a few other games. There's a pretty good library out there for you. So once um, there's more PS5s available for people to buy, buy it. Yeah, yeah. It's I mean, yeah. yeah. Uh, 
Gamer. Other than that, that's that's been about it for me. I mean, disc golf, the Disc Golf Pro Championship Worlds are going on right now. Uh, you weren't going to get through this podcast without Disc Golf coming up at least once, maybe. Wait, uh, do they the, call it Worlds? Yeah, it's World Championships. Yeah, because oh. everyone... Now, this year's a little... So they didn't Who's have... Who's the World... for to look for? Oh, you fucking asshole. Um, first and foremost, right now, I believe Emerson Keith, he's like fucking 20-something years oh, old man, and leading answers. right now. Um, and re- realistically, Paul Macbeth at any point let could me, just take over and win and, and just really I, I'm gonna, let me, I'm gonna cut, me, I'm, yeah, I'm gonna cut in for you. Bobby. Hey, I you, wasn't expecting you to have answers, but okay. <laughs> guess what? I do. <laughs> it's not like the wrong faker, person. Okay. To go. He, I don't um, think he even wanted the answer if there was. I one. didn't. I yeah. didn't. It was. It was me making fun of you. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I knew you were, but then I, I would just lean into it and be yeah. like, "Oh yeah, well I do know who could take you over." I should. Complain. I shouldn't complain. I watched pro wrestling as a as a exactly. almost thirty year old. So you know who else could take over? Bobby, with what he's been doing. Good, good point. Good point. <laughs> um, Based. I've been. I still play. I've been playing Knockout City. It's really fun. Uh, I would really like to play with my boys again. Um, I tried to play with Grant one time, and I ended up getting conned into playing Call of Duty, which you know it's fine. It's that's a, just rude, shit. honestly. I'm going for dark matter, man. Sorry, I said what I said. I don't. I don't know what that means, but sure. Um, I'm sure. I, but uh, it other means than something that, to someone. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it does. Other than that, it's been a lot of, um, you know, just the same old, same old. My schedule is pretty hard and tight. I play. I play D and D on on Mondays. I play uh, uh, Destiny on D and D Sands of Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, I I do Destiny on raid night, and then any day I uh, outside that I try to um, I try to I try to play games. I I have every intention. This uh, well, it won't matter. Uh, on Friday, we were recording today on on uh, Wednesday the twenty third. On Friday the twenty fifth, I plan on trying to stream during the day while go. playing all of. Uh, Resident Evil 7 to get through it because we're going to be talking about it on the first of uh, the first of July and the first of the month in July. No, after that. Uh, oh, the week after that in July. Never mind what Corbin said. Uh, <laughs> Bobby was going to be next. really surprised when I said what we were doing next week, and he'd be like, "Oh, oh no, <laughs> just some bug eyes." Uh, but still, I'm going to try to get through as much of uh, Resident Evil Seven as I can that day, uh, just so I because because I've got the day off of my day job, so I'm nice. going to do that. Um, there you go. Yeah. I love what about that. you, Corbin? What are you up to? So I have been. Uh, I've been watching more horror movies lately because i've been hosting hump day horror for the podcast right if you join join our discord every wednesday night we watch a horror movie together uh so far we've done two of them we watched friday the 13th and then we watched bram stoker's dracula both super awesome movies um i put the emphasis on the wrong word there i'm conflicted about how i feel about friday the 13th (laughs) these days uh and then are you you I, I I am conflicted. Yes. Uh, oh my I god! Finally got him. <laughs> not in the way that I think. Not in the way that you think. I oh, you okay. have, but it, it's. I was it's worried on the way. Um, but oh, no. Grant, Grant, you should be worried. <laughs> uh, so oh, I've been wa- no. I've been watching those, and then I have been playing more Halo lately. Uh, a couple week about a week and a half ago was E three. Uh, there's been a bunch of new Halo Infinite. Uh, news i'm a huge 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 halo fan uh literally today was the start of season seven in the master chief collection so i've been jumping in on that what's the pinnacle i, of gar- the I guarantee once halo infinite happens we will be making teams on the discord for us to be doing games yeah absolutely what's, what's the pinnacle for this season is there something that i should be looking out for uh the big thing this season is uh start yeah Starting like a month ago, they added something called the Exchange, which is an, a place where you can use your extra season points to buy uh, armor sets that are not in the Battle Pass, and that oh. rotates, and sometimes it's stuff that's exclusive to it, sometimes it's stuff from old events uh, that are no longer running, so you can just, you know, you got extra points, buy stuff. Right now, the big thing is that you can get the Halo Infinite 
Mark Seven armor for your Halo Four guy from the exchange. So that's like that's the big awesome. Thing this uh, so I've been doing that, and then I played uh, Dungeons and Dragons Dark Alliance today oh. for about an hour. Um, it is a dark fantasy third-person action game. Uh, it's everything you've heard and less. <laughs> it, yeah. It's not... Should I delete it from my Xbox? It's yes. al- not always necessarily a bad game, but it is a- almost unbearably boring. <laughs> and the levels yeah. are really long. Like, I only did yeah. one mission. <laughs> uh, I played as Caddy Bree the Archer. Honestly, it's, it's just janky and, and boring. I wouldn't recommend it. That's my one hour hot take. I'll probably play it a little bit more just so I can be like sure for sure. Uh, but after an hour, I would say skip it. Decidedly unessential? Uh, decidedly so, yeah. 100%. Uh, but that's everybody. Um, in the meantime, Bobby, you said that you're going to be streaming Resident Evil 7 in the next <laughs> uh, week or so. At this point, that'll probably actually be after this episode airs. Where can people find that stream? Sure, yeah. I, I'll be posting it on all my relevant socials, which you can find on twitch.tv slash the red weenie. Um, I'll be uh, that's where you can watch the stream if you want to. If, uh, and if not, I mean, why not give me a follow anyway? Yeah. It's really helpful and it'd be kind of cool. And then also you can find on my uh, on my user tab, you can find all of my relevant socials. Typically, I think it's my Twitter and my Instagram. Um, so, yeah, twitch.tv slash the red weenie. Nice. Uh, Grant? All right, guys. Um, I... I'm on all handles at gfooty, G-F-O-O-T-E-Y. Uh, basically, right now, the only place you'll see me is on Twitter and my hot takes about the uh, League of Legends professional speen, uh, scene, the LCS, which is the North American scene specifically. Um, I'm fairly in tune to that, and I usually comment when I'm either frustrated or happy about how teams are performing. Um, but that's kind of the only place you'll see me. Uh, eventually, one day, hopefully, you'll be able to see me stream my League of Legends games. Um, which one of them I did throw just to make sure that this podcast was released on time. So, Grant is going to tease us with him streaming League of Legends for like the next six months, and then he's just going to stop mentioning it. <laughs> I have to, because if I don't say that I will, then no one will, and I won't do it. <laughs> Um, Alan, are you going to be streaming League of Legends anytime soon? No, no, I don't do the streaming thing, but I do uh, occasionally tweet, and I'm very good at responding to tweets. Uh, and you can find me at a seal punter just about anywhere that matters. Uh, I don't, uh, yeah, yeah. Instagram, another one. Going to be mostly disc golf over there. And yeah, that's, that's where you can find me. Nice. Uh, you can find me just about anywhere at Corbangering. Twitter is my main place. I posted on Instagram yesterday for the first time in like six months. I'm getting into brandy, so I had to make a post about it. Ooh. Um, you can follow the podcast on Twitter and Facebook at Essential Scares. Uh, if you find us there, you can also find our YouTube channel. Uh, if you're not watching us, you could. YouTube.com, Essential Scares. And you missed some really good physical gag. Good hand gestures. You're not watching this. Yeah, right at the end there, Bobby got real animated. True. <laughs> it's it's the, it's the this move. It really does send it home. All of our uh, socials have the Discord on them pretty frequently. Uh, the Essential Scares socials has it linked uh, just on the we- on the main website, the link tree. So if you're looking to join our Discord, which you totally should, watch our movies with us on Wednesdays. Uh, that's where it's located. With that, though, gents. It wraps us up. This week, it's not 50 been 50 split. Yeah. It's, in the end, it's been unfortunately unessential. In the end. <laughs> it's um, been begrudgingly, but decidedly unessential. A yep. great movie that you should watch. Absolutely. Thank you to everybody for listening. Thank you to everybody for watching. Uh, of course, thank you, Alan, Grant, Bobby, for being on the show with me. Next Always week. A we're watching The Forever Purge. 
Ooh. I have been your host, Corbin, and this has been Essential Scares. I didn't want to watch that.